Hi, I'm Mark Loftus. On this episode of Post TV, I'm joined by Michelle Tesoro, who recently edited all seven episodes of Netflix popular The Queen's Gambit series. Michelle, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I've watched the series. I've enjoyed it. It's a pleasure to have a chance to speak with you and hear a little bit about it. I, I know our readers are always interested in how an editor gets involved in one of these high profile projects. I know you have a history working in film. I know that you've done uh, on the basis of sex. How did you get involved in this particular project? And it's a big project there too, bigger than a feature film. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. So, you know, as, as is everything, uh, it's about relationships. This is my third go around with, with Scott Frank, who was the writer, director, producer um, of this project. Uh, we had done, um, I think the first thing we had, we had done was a, was a pilot for FX called Hope, which did not get picked up. And then the second time we, we worked together was on Godless, which is, sort of a similar thing. I, I, I think it was the first Netflix series that um, limited series that they produced on their own. And um, basically, you know, the team that we had moving forward uh, with the Queen's Gambit, we brought from Godless. So, uh, so that was the first time we did that. And then I think be off of the success of Godless, uh, Scott was able to do, you know, get together and do this Queen's Gambit um, with Cindy Holland was our executive at Netflix and, and because they loved the way that we did it last time, we were able to take that kind of workflow um, and do it this time and of course, at that point like I had, I've done a lot of countless now when I really think about it, I, I've done a lot of Netflix shows. Mm -hmm. And I'm just a familiar face to them. And, and obviously, I mean, I got the job because of Scott, <laughs> but you know, even before- And you're good. Like, they're not just giving it to you because they know your name, you know? <laughs> right, right. I mean, they're, they're like familiar. It's, it's, it's almost like family, even though some of the, some of the staff might change. Like they, you know, like, I, I mean, I did, uh, I worked on the first season of House of Cards. I did a little bloodline. I did- you know, and then uh, right before Queen's Gambit, I, I did When They See Us. So it was sort of a natural, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. There's no questions about me. I just. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Queen's Gambit, it debuted in late 2020. What was your work cycle leading up to that? Were you working in 2019 on it? Was it a 2020 show for you? What was the time frame? Uh, so our time frame was. Uh, we started, uh, they were in pre-production sometime in June, uh, we, June, May, June, uh, and we started shooting in August, at the end of August, and we wrapped shooting um, right before the holidays in December, December 18th, I believe was uh, the last day, and then uh, we finished post uh, we, we were locking episodes in June uh, and we formally finished, um, well, I wrapped in August, at the beginning of August, and we, I think we finally, we had final deliveries in September. So, okay. and that was always going to be our schedule. So we never veered from the schedule. I understand that it was initially planned as a six episode series, but it became a seven episode series. Is that true? Or was it initially going to be the seven episodes the whole time? Uh, it, yes, we started with six scripts. Okay. Um, and yeah, and I guess through, throughout the process, we, we were trying to find some balance with the first four episodes and, and breaking up uh, basically turning episodes two, three, and four into four episodes. That's kind of where, where the, where the breakup started was in episode two. And then later, um, is where we ended up sometime in the spring, uh, when we were in studio cut. Okay. And, uh, I know you had mentioned to me, uh, off camera that, production took place in Germany and a little bit in Canada. Where were you? You're LA based. Where are you while all this is going on? Were you on set at, at any point or were you working from LA the whole time and they were sending you files? What was the workflow? 
So the workflow is, you, you know, I'm, I'm LA based. I met Scott here in LA, but in, in between Hoke and doing Godless, he had moved to New York. And so actually post was, was all done in New York. Hmm. Um, I only had one opportunity to go to Berlin, which was during a pre-production meeting that Scott called the chess summit. Uh, where we met with all um, with some of the um, the chess consultants, uh, there was like a production meeting focused on, you know, the 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 design um, and some of the ideas of how to approach all the chess matches. Uh, so I was there for like four days, like there and back, and then um, I, I think Scott really had wanted me to come out when they were going to shoot. Uh, Paris and Moscow, um, but but that wasn't going to happen budgetarily. We couldn't do that. So um, when I started, I flew to New York, and the plan was I was going to be there from, and, and actually I was from uh, the end of August to the beginning of August of 2020. Wow. So, so yeah, so I was there, I was in New York and the rest of my post crew, the, the post production staff, like the post producer, supervisors, uh, coordinators, uh, my two assistants uh, uh, were both New York based. Where in New York are you working? Is it at a space for rent type of situation? We were, we were. Okay. <laughs> so we were at, and we love this, we, we love this, um, this bullpen that they had at Light Iron New York on um, is the 580 Broadway, mm -hmm. uh, eighth floor. And um, we were there on Godless. We did, we did the same thing. So, you know, right when I knew that we were going to do this show, we had to like make reservations for that space because I knew that Scott really liked working there. Um, and, you know, it was, it was great. It was such a great space. Um, and the staff there, you know, with Carlos Cano and, um, and our colorist, Steve Bodner, they, they were wonderful. Uh, so we just, uh, we worked there and I was there while Scott, so in terms of where they shot, they shot for a week in Toronto in, mm -hmm. in and around Toronto, uh, for the first week. And then they moved shooting to Berlin, which where they did all the main, um, main photography uh, in and around Berlin. So, uh, which was, I think the total amount of shoot days was 82. Wow. So that, that includes sec any second unit that, that they shot. And, um, and yeah, and so we, we did all of post uh, in, sorry, in New York. And even this during, during COVID too. So this is were, during COVID, yeah. You were able to, you know, stay put where, while you were there and continue working at Light Iron? No, no. Oh. So everything had to shut down and literally, you know, actually it's funny when we moved, it was before anyone was forced to move and they all mm -hmm. thought that we were being a little too paranoid, that maybe we're being paranoid, but you know what? We want to support you guys and do whatever you feel comfortable. <laughs> and that, that, that actually turned out to be what everyone had to do like a week later. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we, we moved out of there. Um, yeah, March 13th. Um, yep. And I was staying, you know, because I was, I'm, I was in LA local. So I was a distant hire in New York. So they were paying, you know, I had uh, a place that they were putting me up in, in, in Chelsea. So, um, you know, I moved all my equipment. <laughs> and of course, this time around, when I was in New York, I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to spend more time outside of the apartment and get a studio. Yeah. <laughs> and this is one time you're not allowed to like leave your home. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but it was very comfortable. I mean, you know, it was a large studio for New York, you know, I, I th thought was pretty large for New York. So, and the building that I was in was really nice. So mm -hmm. um, I, I was very comfortable. And at the time when we moved, it was right when we were, we're about a week away from uh, delivering our cuts, our first cuts to Netflix. So I was in the middle of a, of a cut and it was very, upending for a couple of days and mm -hmm. just figuring out all of the staff's internet 
uh, capabilities. And but you know, at that point, we had been in terms of how Scott and I were working. Uh, I had already gotten him uh, used to working on Evercast. We were sort of dabbling with it while he was in Berlin, because you know, as I said before, he had wanted to bring me out, but uh, because that wasn't. Uh, I wasn't going to be able to do that. I was like, hey, let's try this if you want to try to work mm -hmm. while you're shooting. And, and that, that actually turned out to be great because, you know, when we had to use it, he was already sort of used to using it. Um, did, did the production shoot linearly in the sense of episode one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or like what episodes were you working in sequentially? So they were not, uh, it was not shot sequentially. Uh, all of, the six episodes were shot uh, cross-boarded, meaning they just shot whatever was, um, whatever worked for the location mm -hmm. and actor schedules. So typically, it, I mean, for this one, it was a little different because uh, most of episode one with young Beth and Isla Johnson and, and, and all the little girls, that was all kind of done at the same time, which ended up being episode one, you know, they did shoot other scenes um, for those certain locations for other episodes, but um, it was all over the place. So, so you know, what episode did you were you able to complete first? Because the latter episodes seem to have different locations in them. There's always the return to Kentucky. She's on the road right. traveling, you know. Uh, they were not all complete until the last day. Really? Okay. Yeah. So you were that, yeah. So that's why we approached it the way we did is because mm -hmm. you were never going to really have a complete episode. You were you were just going to have complete sequences. Oh, and that's the case for all seven of these episodes. Then they weren't any, no one was finished until they essentially were all finished at the same time. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Wow. What is your uh, what's your workflow as far as receiving camera files? Do you know what they were shooting on and what kind of editing system are you using? So I know they were, oh boy, I know they were shooting on the red and I know they were 8K and we, they went through the, the normal um, transcoding down to Avid DNX files, which I was cutting on. We're on the 2018 Avid. Um, at the time. And what and, resolution are you working on in this? Like, uh, Oh, we did DNX. Ooh, that's a good question. DNX 115 actually, because, and the reason why I did that is because I knew uh, when we worked on Godless, we had done a number of screenings, mm -hmm. you know, in, in a small theater. And so I knew I wanted it to be able to play on a bigger screen. So we went for the higher um, resolution. And, you know, nowadays it's not so hard to, to work with, with those files. It's right. And Netflix has a delivery spec that you have to uh, honor there. I think the 4K sure. spec. So ultimately you're delivering. Yeah, but I don't deal with that. I mean, like yeah. the, the post, yeah, the post producer, uh, Mick and Aceto, um, I mean, we were ready to do, to do their delivery, but in terms of what offline work with, that was, it was the uh, DNX 150. Okay, throughout the series, uh, as you're putting this together, were there challenges for particular scenes? I know you said that nothing was really complete until later on, but what scene or episode might you point to as a, a highlight of your work on it or maybe an interesting uh, scene? I, I noticed one thing with when watching it, a lot of it is just that reactive shots of Beth's face. You know, a lot of it is these almost awkwardly long, uh, expressionless shots of her. And I guess that's part of her persona there. So how do you, how would you describe the, the feel of the show? Oh boy. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so much, it, it's interesting because there's not really one episode that sort of encompasses. I mean, I had a really difficult time trying to find which episode to present for, you know, um, consideration mm -hmm. because I was like, well, I don't know. I like this part in this episode. I love the Paris match in episode six. I, you know, episode one has its merits, you know, it's got mm -hmm. Bill Camp in it, you know, every episode has something interesting. Um, but yeah, I think the overall, uh, 
theme of the show is is sort of Beth alone um, with herself, good and bad, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and how she um, perceives the world and how out of control her normal life is. Yet when she is is playing, that is something she can control and and master. And it's it's interesting because. You know, and when you talk about the reaction, you know, her face and what's going on with her, you know, you're, you're trying, we're trying to kind of open up a window, you know, into her, her inner world. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, I mean, obviously context plays into this, but sometimes you, you see two, her, the two sides of that, that story for her, mm -hmm. you know, through her face. Mm -hmm. This show is not necessarily a visual effects heavy show, but there are visual effects sequences, those ceiling sequences. I don't right. know how much uh, location visual effects there are to give it the look of these different things. And even the interiors, a lot of these hotels are very grand looking. I don't know if they're practical or uh, made in visual effects. What were the visual effects side of it and how did you deal with that? Were you dealing with just blank spots within your edit, knowing that scenes were coming in at some point? So a lot of the locations, I mean, those were locations. Were they? Yeah. And they were, some of them were dressed up to a certain point. I mean, Vegas, that's a real location. Like that's not in Vegas, but right. that is, you know, uh, the locations that Uli Han Hanish, our, um, uh, our production designer helped find, you know, with the location manager were, were amazing. They, they just embodied the things that, that Scott was looking for. Um, but you know, really the visual effects was mostly about the ceiling chess. Mm -hmm. You know, there was not, I mean, in Vegas, okay, so Vegas was a little bit of a mixture of a great location that was what it was and and really what um, our visual effects uh, artists at Chicken Bone with our VFX supervisor, uh, John Manja and, and, and Riz, oh, I'm forgetting her last name, um, but, they created the exterior so it's old vegas in the 60s mm -hmm. and so it was more of, of set extension and also our establisher of vegas that has the big you know title of vegas like they mm -hmm. created that that shot as well so um it was you know so i knew that i mean it, it was just a, li a little easier to kind of because there, there was not a whole lot of you know uh, of, of things where you didn't know what was happening except for the ceiling chest, which, so the, the way that we kind of handled that is they had already storyboarded this. Um, they were already talking about it during shooting of, of what was supposed to be happening. And right away, once I got the footage for that, I would, I put it together according to the storyboard and we would right away turn it over to, to visual effects to start to start their work so that they can have some template. It's like, you know, so Scott and I would, would put these things together and yes, you're looking at, I don't know, nothing. <laughs> so, so it would be a ceiling shot with nothing happening, but it would be yeah. cut in there for, the, for the, uh, the duration that you would need. And then that would be turned over to visual effects. Is that how it would work? Correct, right. So, so you, put, you put the whole scene together with reactions, with, you know, in your mind and in, with what Scott had imagined based on storyboards. And then we would do the storyboard thing and then we try to cut it as close as possible. And then at that point we wanted to give, you know, we give that reference to visual effects. They watch what we cut mm -hmm. and then they start to think, okay, what's gonna be here? And, and a lot of times we'll put like a card you know, uh, queen captures here. This is the opening that maybe we can use here. Mm -hmm. You know, and so our our post supervisor, um, Diana was uh, DeKylo was working with our chess consultants about for this particular scene at this particular moment when little Beth is learning chess, what might she already know? Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of how the pieces move, what they look like, uh, and and we maybe write that. Um, but we also, we'd write it on, on the actual, um, you know, as a card, 
you know, overlaid. Okay. Uh, and then we would have a lot of meetings. We would, they would just go out and in pre COVID times, they would come over yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they would look at it and we would describe what, what might be here. And so they would get an idea and, um, and then go off and do their thing while we work on the other parts of the show. But yeah, uh, the way the, the ceiling chest developed was like over a long period of time. I mean, months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, Interesting, I'd like to hear about the music. Are you working with music that is in the final completed episode? Are you working with some kind of temp? I mean, there were shots, I think it was in Vegas where she goes in and there's that big sweeping staircase and you kind of see everything and music is in an underbed. Do you have that while you're doing the offline or is that a second pass where that comes in? Uh, or is it in the mix that it comes in and you're working with something similar, which is then replaced? W what is the level of music that you're working with in an offline scenario? So in our scenario, we are very fortunate where we are working with our composer from day one. I mean, our composer, Carlos Rafael Rivera, is on is already sketching for this project like up. I think he started a year prior to us shooting. So we already had some ideas. Um, I was not necessarily working. I mean, there's there's a couple of tracks that Scott would say, oh, try this here. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately the way we work specifically um, and my my sound designer, Wiley Stateman would call it post 2.0, but it's, it's a rolling mix where we're working with uh, real sound tracks, real sound design and we're working with the final sound design, the final music as we edit. Okay. So in terms of that, like Scott and I would cut something dry. No, I don't do any effects. I don't do any sound effects work or music work unless it's a needle drop, like a song like the Vegas Q. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We played with a couple of different ones, but we had our music supervisor on also very early. So all these tracks that he was giving us, they were his ideas and clearable, you know, hopeful, clearable ideas. Um, so we would, I would cut it together. Uh, and in terms of the, anything that was gonna have score, it would be dry and then Scott and I would work on it. And then he'd say, okay, send it to, send it down the pipe to sound and music. And they would right away work on their end doing, doing their part. So Carlos would actually score to that even though we were still shooting and we were still cutting. Right, right. You know, just to sort of, you know, it, and it may not end up being that exact cue and, and cut that exact way, but it was a way for him to work through the themes and the sound and what actually worked with picture. And, mm -hmm. and instead of us, and yeah, we don't wait till the very end. And then in terms of the uh, places, places where we were using source, music, for example, we'll talk about the Vegas thing. We had so many different cues in there. And, you know, we work with our, our music editor, Tom Kramer, um, also from probably, they come on about a month before we wrap. Okay. Um, uh, before we know we're, we're getting closer to assembly, there's more sequences for them to work on and to look at, uh, because I've, I've just gotten that far with the cut. Um, and we would go into his room and uh, it, Randy Poster, our, our music supervisor, would, would have sent him a number of cues to try in that area. I would have already cut it, turned it over to him, and, and they would just audition. And once, once we picked a cue, we would then go back and kind of live with it for a really long time, thinking that that was a cue. And specifically that cue, kept getting kicked, like we got a different, we had a different song in there. I don't remember what it was now, um, but we had a different song there for a long, long time. And then at the very end, I want to say maybe <clears throat> it was before we locked, but no, no, well, we never really locked, but it was during the mix. We're like, okay, we're, that's not getting cleared. We have to choose a backup. We have to choose another one. And so we went through the same process of, okay, let's, put in another cue here, what do we like? Mm -hmm. And we got this great, I think what we ended up was with a Quincy Jones piece there. Okay, and, and did your edit change dramatically there? Or it, stay, no. it, it worked within 
the edit that you had? It worked within the edit and our music editor made it work within, uh, made it work. Okay. So he was able to manipulate uh, the temp, some of the tempo, just if we had to nudge it a little bit so mm -hmm. that that horn blast solo kicked in when she turns and looks at the woman coming down the stairs or, or the piano thing is highlighted. Okay. Interesting, interesting. Uh, again, seven hours to complete this series. You worked on it essentially a year. You're saying like from August to August almost. Looking back, what, what do you learn from a show like this that maybe, I know every project has different demands and stuff. Is there anything looking back that you're like, I, I'm smarter because of this, or I, I learned something because of the workflow, the way it changed, or even working during the pandemic? how you kind of were able to succeed? Oh, there's so much to learn from 2020, isn't yeah. there? <laughs> but I think in this specific case, like, you know, I mean, I, I cut all of the episodes, right? And in Godless, when we did Godless, which was the limited series that Scott and I and the same crew did before, I, I assembled 95% of that and it was killer mm -hmm. <laughs> like it was very difficult so this time around i said you know i know these assistants that i'm working with they want to be more creatively involved because of the nature of our workflow which is working with sound designers and working with music editors up front a lot of that work that you, you would have in a normal traditional cutting room where they might be doing sound effects or they might be doing that. Now they have the time and the bandwidth to to cut, to to learn how to cut, to exercise those muscles. Because as an assistant, you you don't get an opportunity sometimes mm -hmm. you know, to do that. So this time around, I wanted to utilize that um, to the point where that they could handle, you know, and so this time, and I, I feel like it really worked was I, I divided the work up, you know, in terms of assembling. So I gave whatever I thought they could handle for their day, because I know that they had other stuff that they needed to mm -hmm, do. Mm -hmm. And I took on, uh, you know, I usually took on the harder stuff and they would, they would cut a little bit, the things that I knew that I could guide them through. And to me, that was like a really good lesson in learning how to communicate um what you need creatively out of out of somebody else and also opening myself up to their creative input you know because no one's gonna cut the same thing the same so and i knew that in the end i mean at, at, once i was cutting with scott that it was going to be all me you know mm -hmm. at that point but so this was my opportunity to let other ideas come in so that was one is i i thought that was a really good thing that allowed me to kind of work on the harder, harder parts of the show. Um, the other things that I could do my sleep, I could then teach somebody else to do. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so that was good. I, I think also just working from home, <laughs> you know, I had already been doing it little by little, like I had been hiding working from home. Um, because I like being able to get up and say, oh, you know, I woke up and I thought about this one idea and then I can go right right away and work work at it instead mm -hmm. of, okay, now I got to get ready to go into work. Now I have to do, you know, there's this ramp up of getting into a physical office and then a ramp down to leave. And mm -hmm. to me, I, I, during this, I realized that I was way, especially when you have an an hour long commute, which I do in Los Angeles anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's like two and a half hours of time that I got back. Yeah. Yeah. Time that you know, non-productive time you're in your car, you're driving and stuff. Exactly. So I, I think that was, that was one of the things that I learned in this. Do you think we're going to see more remote working because it has been successful in 2020 just by circumstances you were able to work remotely do you think that will be adopted more or do you think that once the pandemic you know is more under control people will be going back in and out of their studio space i think for those who really enjoyed it or felt like they were they felt more creative more free in their 
work-life balance even, uh, there now there's no excuse, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think I think they will do more of it. I mean, I, but I also think there are those people out there who, I, I mean, there are a lot who like really did not enjoy it and really knew that, okay, I really like the separation or I like being able to get together if we can get together. And, and actually, you know, through this, you know, because of course we were thinking about how we would do it the next time. And, and, you know, Scott totally wants to do everything all remote. He loved it. He is mm. such an introvert. He doesn't like the, to gather. He doesn't <laughs> like, so we, we will be doing it when we're working with him again. Um, but there are certain things that I, I, I saw that I did miss. Um, and now I value more, which is when you're screening and you're screening for a group of people, that is something that you don't, you, you don't get that experience when you just send out a pix link to watch it. You know, you don't get how people are shifting in their chair and how they're reacting, how they're breathing in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's pretty valuable to me. Plus I think the mixing of it all, I still think we need to be in the same room. I, I'm not, I know people are trying to work on the technology there so that it's more one-to-one -one and I'm sure it'll, it'll get there, which would be great. Mm -hmm. But I still like to be, again, I still like to be in a room, especially if you're doing a movie and you want to know what it's going to sound like, even if that means you're in that room for a week. Mm -hmm. Are you on to your next project at this point? Did you have a little time off? What's next for you? Uh, this is like the thousand dollar question. Um, <laughs> um, yes and no. <laughs> I'm in the middle. I'm transitioning to what? the next project will be. Uh, there is something in mind I can't speak of and I am currently helping a friend out on a project. So I did take some rest, okay. but not really. So I'm hoping that after I finish this thing for the friend that I'll have a month off before I do the next gig. Oh, very cool. Well, we want to thank you for sharing your insight on the Queen's Gambit uh, with our readers and our audience. I think it's uh, great to hear your perspective on such a massive project that's seen a lot of success. Uh, and I wanted to thank you again. So, Michelle, again, thank you for your time. And hopefully we can talk about some of your work down the road again, too. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Excellent.